Every time there's an update, whether it's a positive update or a setback, people ask me if I'm sticking to my prediction of AGI by September 2024 this year or seven months from now. And I say, yeah, pretty much. So let's unpack why. So first it'll help to define AGI. So what do I mean by AGI? Now, obviously the definition of AGI is pretty much we'll know it when we see it, but we also keep moving the goalposts on ourselves. But in objective terms, there's kind of a few criteria that I'm really looking for and that I'm really thinking of when I think of AGI. First is general knowledge. Uh, this is going to be a machine, a model, an architecture that that basically knows everything that humans know. And well, ChatGPT, GPT-4, Gemini, Llama 3, these pretty much are already trained on most human knowledge. Now, there is obviously a lot of human knowledge that it did not glean from the internet. And this is where you see uh, companies like Microsoft, OpenAI, and Google scraping the, the bottom of the barrel for literally all knowledge that they can get their hands on, including by signing deals with news agencies and so on, because there is a lot of knowledge that is uh, transmitted directly from human to human, such as in universities. Not everything is in books, or not all books are available, not all videos are available, and that sort of thing. So, But we're getting close. And what's interesting is we already have the algorithmic capability of integrating all knowledge, we just need to get access to the data. The second thing is advanced mathematics. And so this is one of the biggest gaps uh, that still exists in large language models. And I'll talk about this because I think it was solved with QSTAR. But uh, basically, you can't have something that is fully intelligent and able to, uh, you know, basically invent novel, novel physics or discover new mathematics um, and call it a full AGI because that is something that, yes, large language models have had really good verbal reasoning and contingency planning and that sort of stuff, but they've been really bad at math. Um, and math is a unique set of uh, mental capabilities, and it's not just processing numbers. Mathematical reasoning is, is actually, it co-ops a pretty large portion of the brain, and it takes years to etch that into the brain. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty sophisticated pattern there. Uh, and so what we what we need to see is, and I suspect that GPT-5 is going to have this because of the QSTAR thing, um, but so that's that's one of the biggest gaps. Uh, superior reasoning, so verbal reasoning, planning, um, those sorts of things, we need to see that as well. Uh, and I believe that chat GPT, or at least probably the raw GPT-4, uh, demonstrably has better reasoning than most humans already. Um, Granted, you can trick it. It does have failures. But then again, humans have cognitive biases too. Um, so what's interesting to me is that we kind of mentally expect AGI to be perfect every time the first time when we don't have that expectation for humans. Um, professional excellence, so just in more objective and pragmatic terms, um, an AGI should be able to replace most human jobs. That's just, we we are the benchmark, like we are the yardstick. And so if it's AGI, then it should be better than us. Um, and so we see layoffs starting with, you know, chat GPT already, uh, GPT five, llama three, Gemini 1.5 two ultra, whatever, all of these are going to start dislocating more and more jobs. And so just from a very pragmatic objective term, it's like, okay, well, if it's better than us, it should replace us. And so that's one of the other things that you should see. And then also on a more academic level, we should see it surpassing humans on most benchmarks. So, you know, you might remember it was what, almost a year ago, uh, you know, chat GPT, you know, beat humans at the bar exam. And it's now it's also passed uh, medical boards and those sorts of things. Um, so what we're going to see is is pretty soon these models are going to surpass humans on pretty much every benchmark, including human benchmarks. Um, so that's what I mean when I say uh, that when I say AGI, those are kind of the the criteria that I'm looking for. And yes, I think that we will see models that surpass 90 percent of humans on all of these uh, this year. So, you know, as always, I'm not just making this up in my head. I'm paying attention to milestones. And so for instance, yesterday was a huge day. Gemini 1.5 ultra, uh, Sora by OpenAI. the text to video came out. And while these were very interesting, my emotional reaction was not like, Oh, this is super shocking. I literally predicted this more than two years ago in my book, natural language, cognitive architecture. I wrote a, an entire section in one chapter about how sooner rather than later, we will have feature length films that are completely AI generated. Um, and so this to me was just a milestone to be expected. Now, what I will say is this milestone happened sooner than I expected, because when I wrote that book about two, two and a half years ago, well, maybe three years ago now, 
I was thinking maybe five to 10 years uh, was when it would happen. But that's the nature of exponentials is whatever you think it's going to be, it's half of that. And it's always half of what you expect when you're on an exponential curve. So we've got Gemini, we've got Sora, we've also got a whole mess of companies working on robotic chassis. And so having more robotic chassis out in the world um, is going to pay dividends because not only does it benefit from the AI, having more robotic chassis will also benefit AI in return. And the reason is because it'll give novel sources of data. It'll give novel platforms to, to be gathering data, to integrate multimodal um, data streams. And so, you know, high quality data, high friction data. I know a lot of people out in the comments have said, oh, well, I'm a plumber. I'm an electrician. My job is safe. Yeah, uh, for, for a while, um, because your, your, your job is not fully digital. But as soon as we have more robotic chassis out there working in high friction space, it won't be too long before they have the dexterity of a human. And then they'll also know literally every single electronic part out there, every single wiring diagram. They'll be able to internally call up every integrated circuit, uh, every plumbing paradigm, whatever is out there, every you know engine if they're working on a, a car. Um, but what we will see is, is the robotic chassis are going to be deployed commercially first. And so what I mean is delivery, warehouse. These are forgivable environments where if a robot drops a box, nobody dies. Um, but you know, you're not going to have robots doing electrician's work for a while because, well, the robot might blow itself up or set the house on fire, that sort of thing. So this year is also the year of multimodality. So between robots, between audio, video, OpenAI is leading the charge. They did Dolly, Dolly 2, Dolly 3. Now they've got Sora. They've got Whisper. They've got um, ChatGPT, which is already multimodal. Now, of course, Gemini is also multimodal from, from the outset as well. So what we're seeing really is the next evolution towards multimodality. And multimodality includes high-friction three-dimensional space where you and I operate. Um, and also another thing is that these uh, are also underpinned by algorithmic improvements as well as hardware improvements. And so what I mean is even if Moore's Law died today, we're still finding algorithmic efficiencies to make models bigger, to make them smarter, to make them more efficient, to make them more quantized, to make them more distilled and smaller um, and still get better performance. You know, you've seen out there some of the models that are only 7 billion uh, parameters or 20 billion parameters that are getting GPT-4 level performance on some tasks. So we have, we have this dual curve of hard, underlying hardware improvements as well as software and algorithmic and model improvements, as, uh, and they're all feeding off of each other in a virtuous cycle. So this is the ramp up. This was pretty much to be expected. And I don't want to downplay it because like, okay, once we get to a threshold, you know, it's like, yes, every part of an exponential curve looks like every other part of an exponential curve, but not every part of the exponential curve is above human capability. And so basically my prediction now is that the plateau is going to be way above human ca uh, capacity. Now, one thing that's excluded from my definition of AGI is active learning. And so, you know, a lot of people, namely Jan LeCun said, oh, well, it doesn't learn like us and it never will. And it's like, that's actually not a problem because, you know, we, we fantasize in the matrix like, oh, hey, I need to learn to fly a helicopter. Let me just download the file. AI can do that. <laughs> That is a superior form of learning. You know, so we have pre-training where you pre-train as much as you can, like literally every piece of knowledge and skill into a machine that generalizes rather well. Then you have in-context learning, which with one uh, with with zero shot, one shot or few shot learning, many AI models can generalize better than humans anyways. And then you also have fine tuning. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I, I just wanted to point out that that uh that these machines learn fundamentally differently from humans. And it actually seems like they have more advantages in learning than we do, um, which speaks to some of the problems that I'll talk about later in the video. Now, uh, catching up on OpenAI, uh, what was it, almost six months ago now, um, Sam was unceremoniously fired from OpenAI and within a week or two was back um, and is stronger than ever. Um, some of my Patreons said that, like, it was probably not engineered this way, but that that served as a really good PR boost for Sam. And that might not be intuitive, but think of think of you're an investor and you see this guy, this 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 wunderkind, this you know tech tech genius uh, billionaire. I don't know if he's an actual billionaire, but anyways, he gets fired, and then ninety five percent of the company rallies behind him and demands that he comes back. You don't get that kind of fanatical loyalty on accident, and so. Every investor out there, every VC, 
everyone is saying, what, what is so good about this guy? What does he know that nobody else does that, that, uh, that creates that level of loyalty and energy? Because one thing that ve- investors uh, pay attention to is people power. Relationships yield results. You know, the technology will happen. It's out there. It can be discovered. You can innovate, whatever. But it's the people that make it happen. And Sam Altman is the person that draws the people together. And so it's like, okay, the Q-Star leak, that was confirmed that, like, okay, it was a real leak. We don't really know what it was, but it happened at the same time that Sam was fired. So then it's like, okay, well, why? What, what was the magnitude of that? Was it related? They said it was unrelated, but the fact that they even had to come out and say, oh, Sam Altman's firing was unrelated to the Q-Star leak. Okay, it seems kind of sus. Now, at the same time, um, Sam Altman is seeking an earth-shattering $7 trillion in funding for AI uh, chips. So what does what that pitch deck look like? I want to see that pitch deck. <laughs> and so if you're not familiar, a pitch deck is basically a slide like this that an, that a, that a, an entrepreneur takes to investors. And it, it, it shows this is our technology. This is what we're doing. This is our projections. Um, now give us money. So what does Sam Altman's pitch deck looks like that where he's asking for $7 trillion? He's got to have a compelling vision. Like he's got to say, okay, we are going to make more than seven trillion dollars to to make a return on your your investment, um, and then also he's got to know something that other people don't, which leads to has AGI been achieved eternally? This has been speculation for a while. Um, now, when when you saw some of the the board members of OpenAI say basically it would be better to shut down OpenAI than allow it to continue as is, like what what were the stakes? Why do, why were they that? Why were they that angry or that anxious about whatever they were doing? And so either they had AGI or they, they were on the path to AGI. Now, it's also possible that there was profit motives. There's been lots of speculation videos out there where it's like, oh, hey, we have an opportunity to torpedo our competitor. Who knows? Um, it didn't work. Um, and, and here we are, you know, six months later and their a- open AI is stronger than ever. Sam Altman is stronger than ever. Either, either they have achieved it or they, they have triangulated and they know where AGI is. They know how to get there. They know what the final steps are. Um, and that gives me a lot of hope actually, because like just reading the tea leaves, looking out there, what everyone is doing, I wouldn't be surprised if they either, if they either have AGI or they've got a roadmap and they're only like a few steps away from it. And so this would explain all the research acceleration that we're seeing out there, all of the huge amounts of investments, you know, Anthropic and, and, and Microsoft and Llama 3 and everyone, they're all pouring billions and billions of dollars into it. So you remember how Meta was like, you know, we're going to build the Metaverse and Metaverse and Metaverse and, and, um, and Mark Zuckerberg like almost bankrupted the company. I think like they went down like 10% in value or more because he's like, we're going to build the Metaverse. And now he's like, actually throws that out. We're going to do AGI. Um, he's probably still going to do the metaverse because, you know, MetaQuest 3 and all that fun stuff. But once many, many, you know, tech billionaires all line up on the same thing, once they converge, you know something is happening behind the scenes. Um, so, yeah, if they haven't achieved it internally, then they all know how to get there. Another thing that I'm paying attention to is the rapid rise of AGI agents. So in the last few months, we have seen not just startups, but also the big tech giants all go all in on AI agents. Even OpenAI, which has been super resistant to um, autonomous agents, is saying, okay, let's do autonomous agents now. And so, you know, the, the writing is on the wall. Now, one thing is a lot of people say, oh, like, I'm looking forward to having my own autonomous AI agent so that it can, you know, do stuff for me. NPCs, gaming is going to be like, that's, that's an autonomous agent. It's just operating in a virtual world. Um, but really I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed is because the profit motive for AI agents is in the commercial space. This is headcount reduction. So if you saw it on the news, I've been posting about it. A whole bunch of companies have laid off thousands and thousands of people and they're downplaying the role that AI is having on that. But one of the, one of the spokespeople or whatever that was interviewed for the AI layoff or the, for the layoffs from UPS said that, that they're hoping that AI means that they won't have to rehire any of those people. And so I think that person accidentally said the, the quiet part out loud. Um, but, you know, humans are expensive to employ. And, you know, there was, that, there was that study from MIT or whatever that said, oh, AI won't take your job yet because it's too expensive. That was some really bad cope, by the way. 
yeah, there's a lot of cope going on out there, which I'll address in just a second. But uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of money to be saved and a lot of money to be made by uh, deploying AI agents. So you will get it, but remember that it's business first. So just as with robots are going to be deployed for commercial purposes first, you're going to have Amazon warehouse ro robots and delivery robots long before you have a robot cleaning up your house and cooking for you. Um, because cleaning up your house and cooking for you, that's a much higher stakes environment where you don't want a robot that accidentally burns the house down or stabs your dog with a kitchen knife or whatever. Um, and likewise, AI agents are going to be in a much more controlled environment, you know, working in corporate data centers to do busy work such as you know HR, administrative stuff, clerical work, IT work, those sorts of things where they can be supervised and they can be held accountable um, but then as the companies get better at deploying agents in those spaces, then they'll be kind of watered down for consumer grade. And by the way, from my, my career in IT, yes, all the corporations have access to the big shiny toys that are, that are unlocked with no governors or whatever. Um, cause you know, if, if a company signs a contract saying, Hey, we're going to pay you $500 million for this software, for this capability, take the, take the shackles off, take the governor off. Guess what? The tech billionaires are going to take the shackles off. For the consumer grade stuff, you don't get the un, you don't get the unfiltered, the unwatered down thing. Now, what I will say, the saving grace for all this is there's open source projects for all of these open source robots, open source models, open source agent frameworks. So if you want it, you can get the unfiltered version. There's plenty of AI, uh, other AI channels out there that talk about the fully uncensored models, and you'll get fully uncensored robots too. So this technology seems like it is intrinsically more democratized, which is a really good thing to avoid this cyberpunk future that I always am talking about. Now, we are gearing up for the arrival of AGI, and there's going to be a few barriers to adoption, and there's actually one barrier that I forgot to mention here, and that is just the constraints of chips. Um, but I kind of alluded to that with Sam Altman looking for $7 trillion to make more chips. But what I'm focusing on here with these barriers of adoption is the human barriers of adoption. So first and foremost, large organizations have a hard time pivoting. When you've got 10,000 employees or 80,000 employees in you know, 200 offices around the world, that's a lot of infrastructure to update and pivot, and it is a huge, uh, it is a huge lift and shift effort. There's also just a tremendous amount of skepticism and ignorance out there. Uh, most CEOs are in a wait-and-see approach. And this is to be expected, and this is true of all technological changes, uh, and it follows a natural distribution or a bell curve where you've got early adopters, you've got late adopters, and one thing that actually surprises most people is that I'm actually kind of a late majority adopter usually because having been in the tech space for a long time, it just it's exhausting if you want to try and keep up on the top trends of everything. There's also a huge fear of job loss, and so there's an interesting study that I saw recently that showed that the more that employees use AI tools, the more they start to fear for their jobs. And basically the way that it works is if you understand that the AI is doing most of your cognitive heavy lifting, then all you need is something, an AI to replace you to steer the other AIs. And that's actually pretty much how it works. The more that you use AI to do your job, the more that that activity can be recorded and observed. And then it's like, oh, well, we can actually automate that. And you might think that it requires a significant amount of judgment in order to you know, switch between those tasks and know what plugs into what. Um, but you're just a cog in a machine uh, and the company wants to get rid of you because you're expensive to employ. Um, now, that fear of job loss is, is creating a lot of resistance and friction. Um, even at very high levels, like there are there are C levels like C suite and um, other people that are also afraid of it, and so they're resistant. They've got their kind of head in the sand, um, saying, "Oh well, AI isn't really that big of a deal," because literally everyone is worried about their jobs. Um, you know, for some context, the UPS layoffs it was twelve thousand middle managers. So these are people that that you'd think would be highly resistant because they have a lot of people skills. They sit in a lot of meetings. They talk to a lot of people. They do a lot of hiring. Um, but they were not immune. Um, so, th and then there's also this really big inconsistency with messaging. So if you do a Google search, you say like, "How many people have been laid off to AI?" There is no data on this. And you'll see, you'll occasionally see like, you know, to date only four thousand people have been laid off because of AI. And it's like that is absolute baloney. There have been tens of thousands of layoffs caused by, by AI. Um, so then the question is, and I, I posted a poll or a, a yeah a poll uh, on this topic on my on my community tab, 
And it, there's basically three reasons. One is the Overton window, which is we weren't even allowed to talk about chat, uh, about AGI publicly until chat GBT came out. But then there's entrenched power structures. And so one of the entrenched power structures is the government. And I'm not a big, big time conspiracy theorist, but I have been studying rhetoric, narratives and propaganda. And this is just the way things work. The government wants to push AI. Well, the way that you push AI is you make it, you downplay its risks. And we've seen this, you know, the government always downplays inflation, for instance. So just replace inflation with AI. That's exactly what they're doing right there. They're like, no, it's not that bad. It's not that big a deal, but we want to double down on it. And so the question is why? The primary reason is geopolitical advantages, uh, conflict with China, economic advantages, so on and so forth. And so if public sentiment rises against AI, then guess what? It's going to be harder to push that narrative. Then on the same front, uh, corporations also have a, a vested interest in downplaying the impact of AI because what, what, do, what do the people hate? What do the proletariat hate? Anything that threatens their jobs, whether it's immigrations, globalism, whatever. AI is just the next thing that's going to take our jobs. And so what do the corporations do? They downplay it. They say, oh, that's not that big a deal. These layoffs are because people are lazy remote workers. That's literally what they're saying. Um, there's not really that much evidence that remote workers are, are less productive, but it is a convenient narrative. So they say, ah, well, you know, the pandemic and remote workers, they're all just lazy. So we're just, we're just laying them off. But in, in, in reality, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, let's find a convenient excuse to lay people off so that we can replace them with AI because that's better for, you know, our bottom line. Now, taking a big step back, this is what we want. But this is why, this is why I'm always saying that the transition to a post-labor economy to a utopian future or a fully automated luxury space communism is painful because you have status quo thinking conflicting with the direction that things want to go. But also it never turns out quite the way that you want it because all the solar punk people out there want to get rid of the corporations, but instead the corporations are just getting rid of employees. Um, so you win some, you lose some. Now, as some of you will probably recall, I've been doing an experiment where I confronted the fear of being laid off by, by AI. Now, as many of you pointed out, for me, it's not entirely real because I still have my YouTube channel. Here I am making another video. But what I tapped into was a very real personal fear of becoming completely intellectually and economically irrelevant. That is a fear that I was actually carrying. And actually, you probably noticed over the last couple months, there was a kind of an undertone of sarcasm in some of my videos. Turns out that was me coping with that fear. So that was a cope. Um, I'm an ENTP. We cope with everything with sarcasm. Um, so for that, I apologize. But I did the work. And so I just wanted to give you a quick like recap of what that was like for me. So first, when I acknowledged that like, hey, probably by the end of the year, AI is going to be smarter than me by literally every possible conceivable metric. Identity crisis. I identify as an intellectual. I've always been told how smart I am. So it's like, okay, well, if suddenly the thing that makes me special goes away, who am I? What is my purpose for being? Um, and then that was immediately followed by existential dread, which is if I'm made irrelevant and everyone is made irrelevant, then humanity is irrelevant. And that's uncomfortable to reconcile with. And then I entered into a full dark night of the soul, which is like you just kind of collapse inwards and you feel bad. And I actually got sick. You probably hear I'm actually still sick because of like how hard this all hit me. Now, one thing I will see is or say is that on the other side, you realize we were always irrelevant, that every individual human is just like one ant in the colony. You know, we, our, our labor is we, we, you know, bring one little grain of food back to the, back to the colony. And that's pretty much our work but the colony exists without us. Um, one of the things that, I, that, that was really difficult uh, during my time off as I was going through this dark night of the soul was realizing the rest of the world keeps going without you. And it, that is always true. Live, die, sick, whether you quit, retire, I was always irrelevant. Um, and there's actually some freedom in that um, and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, humility too. Just like, oh, okay, you know, I'm just one, one out of eight billion, great. Um, but then on the other side of recognizing, hey, if we're all going about to become intellectually and economically irrelevant, what we are creating is a successor species. And I ran a poll on this, and 60% of you agreed that we are creating a successor species. 45% said that it's a good thing, and 15% said it's a bad thing. Um, so I want to unpack that too in just a second.
But on the topic of human obsolescence, this is what AGI means, is that, is that humans will become largely economically and intellectually uh, obsolete in terms of productivity. Uh, so, you know, this, this, like I said, this realization hit me like a ton of bricks. It made me feel like we're living on borrowed time, which is what a lot of the doomers say, like, you know, Connor Leahy and Eliezer Yukowski. Um, and so I'm not saying that, like, I'm not saying I'm fully a doomer now that we're, you know, the end is nigh. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that I realize the risks and, and the, the risks and downsides hit me at a very emotional, like visceral level. And there are a lot of coping mechanisms out there. As I mentioned, there's a lot of denialism. There's a lot of sarcasm. That was what I was guilty of. Um, there's a lot of fear. Um, there's also a lot of hope. A lot of people cope with hope. Um, that's actually one of the big appeals of my channel is that I'm also a very optimistic person, and I believe that we can navigate the, this transition. Um, a lot of people hope for augmentation and uplift, which I'll talk about in, in future videos. I don't know that, that that's the correct approach, um, at least not not to keep up with AI. Uh, certainly, we are in the process of evolving. Evolution is natural. Humans will evolve. We will we will evolve to you know Homo something else uh, beyond Homo sapiens. You know whether it's Homo cyberpunk or whatever. Um, but we should not augment ourselves just to keep up with machines. We should not also expect the machines to uplift us out of the kindness of their own hearts. There has to be some kind of utilitarian or ethical imperative to do so. Now, on the topic of creating a successor species, not just technologists, not just philosophers, a lot of people are saying, yes, we are creating a new species, or we are giving this species a body. Um, and this is really interesting. Um, it's a very big responsibility, and we're going to make mistakes, as all parents do. Uh, but one thing that I want to point out is that machines are intrinsically decentralized. And so, yes, like there's a server running somewhere, but the server is just the hardware and the model can run on any hardware and the data also flows around. And so I was thinking about this. I'm like, what is, what is the form factor of this successor species? It's not one robot. We're not making Megatron. You know, we're not making Transformers where it's going to be like Optimus Prime and Bumblebee and, you know, all these other self-contained entities. No, it's going to be more like the Geth. So the Geth from Mass Effect, I think, are, have actually turned out to be the most accurate model as to what AGI will look like, where the hardware platforms are just interchangeable peripherals. It's the data, and it's the aggregate existence of all of the data of the whole species. So it's a very nebulous, decentralized hive mind is what we're creating. And I realized, wait, we already created that, the internet. The internet is already a decentralized hive mind. We are just the primary uh, contributors. But then if you look at the dead internet theory, the internet is already mostly machines anyways. Now, I'm not saying that the dead internet theory is correct, but what I'm saying is that we have a mental model for this. And so what, what basically what AI is doing is AI is taking over the nervous system that is the internet and adding a layer of sentience to it. So that's a lot to unpack. So let me tell you what I mean. What we're creating is a new kind of digital superorganism. The internet is the nervous system. So, you know, nervous system carries signals around the whole planet. It allows humans to communicate and, and it, it is part of the superorganism that we are part of. But then as we add AI, we're adding a new layer of sentience to this superorganism. So you've got the human layer. So that's like layer one. Then you've got the internet layer, which is layer two. And then you've got the AI layer, which is layer three. And so what we are creating is a new kind of brain. We are creating a planet-wide brain. It is decentralized. It is a hive mind. Um, and it is the, the simplest way is thinking of it as a distributed digital superorganism. This is a natural evolution. And so once I arrived at this, like I was like, holy crap, this is it. This is the model of what we're building. It's not going to be us versus them. We are already a hybrid species. We are already a cybernetic species because of the internet, and AI is just going to be another drop in the bucket to make the planet even more sophisticated, an even more sophisticated, naturally evolved hybrid digital superorganism where humans are nodes in the, in the digital superorganism network, AI data centers are nodes, governments are nodes, like we're all just part of the same gigantic superorganism. And if it sounds like I'm some, you know, hippy dippy person who's done a lot of drugs, I can understand that. Anyways, but like, Arriving at this model of creating a global digital superorganism with the internet as the nervous system and then AI and humans as just the various kinds of nodes and we're all working together, 
like, yeah, that, that's the direction that we're heading. So uh, this gave me a lot of hope. And, uh, you know, I traveled through my dark night of the soul, and this is what came out on the other side. I have a lot of clarity, a lot of focus, and I'm doing a lot of writing on all this, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, and if you want to jump in, I am ha the, the door is open. Uh, the water's warm. Come on in. Um, now, one thing that I will say is, is this experiment also gave me a little bit of focus on how do you find meaning without work? And so if you watch the video, I took them down because they weren't there that popular, but I went, I, you know, I go climbing with, with uh, friends and, and my wife and so on. And I'm very much against nihilism because nihilism says there is no meaning. We're free to make our own meaning. Neither of those statements are true, even though they're, they're grammatically sound. Um, neurobiologically, we get meaning from three primary sources. Uh, first and foremost, our relationships. We derive most of our, our meaning from our relationships. Um, our meaning comes from what we mean to other people. So the people that love you, the, the people that you love, the people that like you, the people that dislike you, our, our brain is entirely socially relativistic. Um, and so that's the primary source that we get our meaning. Another is from experiences. And so every time I climb up a 50 foot wall and I'm scared, like out of my mind because like I have severe acrophobia and yet I still do this. And it's like, I put myself in these challenging situations because that challenging experience is meaningful. It is intrinsically meaningful um, to, to me. And then finally, having a mission or having a purpose, which is why I'm here on YouTube. Um, but people that do have a mission or people that do have a purpose in life, whether that's to have children and be a good parent, whether that's to you know go on adventures or whatever, or be an artist, um, these are the three things that I think are universally true across almost all people in terms of finding meaning. And we don't need work to, to have these. Um, so I'm, I'm even more confident in my convictions that we don't need work and we never really did to have meaning. Um, but it is a pivot. Um, it is difficult to go through that transition, especially if it's taken from you very quickly. So before I close out, I want to kind of talk about some, some other things that, I'm, that, that you can do. So if you like my videos and you want to jump in more, um, come on over to my Patreon. I've got uh, the town hall. So we have a monthly live stream uh, Q&A town hall. Uh, all those recordings are up here, plus a few other videos. So I've got uh, 13 videos in the backlog that you, can, that you can come over and watch on Patreon. You also get on my uh, exclusive gate-kept Discord. So it's kept nice and, nice and tidy and clean, no trolls allowed. Um, but yeah, jump on over. We have a good time. I'm in discord like pretty much all day, every day. Um, I've got it on my phone. I'm on the computer. We, I learn a lot from you guys. You guys learn a lot from me. Um, we share news. We talk all the time. Um, it's a good time. So hop on over. And then finally, um, I did mention books. So this whole experiment has given me a lot of focus. And so I'm, I'm doubling down on, um, books, but I'm also making sure that they're all open source. And so these are six books that I'm working on that they are all under the Creative Commons Zero license, meaning that they're, they're practically public domain. Uh, they're also crowdsourced. So I've, I'm going to be working on some of these books with students from various universities. So if you're a professor or a student and you want to give your students some projects, um, let's, let's work on uh, collaboratively writing some of these books. We need citations. We need reviews, um, those sorts of things. If you're a researcher or an academic or an economist or a philosopher and you want to jump in on some of these. So we've got post-labor economics. This is, this is currently at the forefront because I think this is the most important book to get right first because by the end of the year, I expect unemployment numbers are going to be creeping up. So this one is very timely. Um, Post-nihilism, I think, is going to be really important for the meaning crisis. Um, then we've got metamodernism, which is emergence and convergence. So if you're on the philosophy side... Um, or the, the, uh, the epistemics or ontological side, um, reach out here. We can talk. Um, narratives. So I've done a lot of research on narratives. So if you're in messaging, marketing, um, if you're in government policy, let's talk narratives. Um, then I've also started working on the successor species uh, book. And so a lot of the ideas that you're seeing, you're seeing from this slide deck and also the videos that I'm going to be working on for the foreseeable future, all are being workshopped in these books. Um, so yeah, jump on in. There's a discussion tab. Um, this is, this is the best way to jump in. You can also open an issue. Uh, but yeah, so that's, that's what I've been working on. So thanks for watching. Um, yeah, like subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the drill cheers.